morning. Welcome to our Zoom discussion on institutional racism at Trent University. We'll hear from a panel of Trent faculty who are engaged one way or another at the administrative level and are familiar with the challenges of identifying institutional racism at our own university. Our goal is to explore how we can better understand what institutional racism is, how it works or is perpetuated within our own institutions, as well as to identify ways to counter it and contribute to better educational diversity and inclusion outcomes. Our panel today includes Jillian Balfour, Momen Raman, Byron Stoles, and me, Heather Nickel, Director of the School of Study of Canada. I'm going to ask each panelist to not only identify themselves again as they speak, but also identify their role in the administrative structure of Trent University. We're going to discuss a broad range of questions related to the definition and understanding of institutional racism, how we perceive it works at Trent, and also what we think educational diversity and inclusion might look like at the end of the day. I'm going to begin by asking Momen Raman to introduce us to the topic. What is institutional racism? Why would we want to look at it, Trent? Why is now, or what does it look like at Trent? And why is now a good time to reflect on institutional racism at Trent University? Moment, can you begin? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Heather. Um, my name is Momen Rahman. I'm a professor of sociology at Trent, uh, but I also hold a role as the co-chair of the equity committee for the Canadian Association of University Teachers, which is a national affiliate of um, faculty associations around Canada. Um, so I have some experience of these issues, you know, through that role as well as being at Trent. I've been at Trent for, you know, 13 years now, I think. Um, and it seems that because of the worldwide protests against police brutality directed towards African Americans, but also other racialized communities, um, there's, there's a great moment right now culturally um, to think about racism um, and what struck me is that in Canada, um, that debate very quickly moved towards um, talking about structural racism as manifested through society's powerful institutions. And I think one of the first um, uh, targets for that conversation was the RCMP. Um, but we've got many different uh, organizations now thinking about this. Um, and I think that that means that it's a good moment for us to think about um, how institutional racism operates in universities. A quick word on evidence. I think we're not going to, um, you know, delve into uh, a debate about whether it exists, um, but there is actually quite a lot of evidence that institutional racism operates in Canadian universities. There's a great study from 2009 called the Equity Myth. Um, and one of the authors of that study, Professor Melinda Smith, has done a follow-up study about leadership um, in Canadian universities, showing how it lacks both gender um, equity, um, but also uh, ethnic diversity uh, for racialized minorities. So, you know, that evidence is out there. And I think, you know, we can obviously provide some links to that um, in any uh, comments that people make on the, the video. Institutional racism it's actually a phrase that was coined back in the days of um, the Black Power Movement in um, the US uh, in the late 60s. Since then, it's really become a kind of widespread analytical and so sociological term. And one of the really useful things I think about it is that it, it talks about the way that normalized practices and policies in an organization end up excluding or disadvantaging certain minorities. And that could be um, equity seeking groups like women who are not a minority, but also racialized minorities, um, people with disabilities. And I think the, the great thing about institutional racism as a concept, as a way of thinking through, is that it says that it doesn't require individuals to be racist. It doesn't say you're a racist and therefore this is why the institution is like this. In fact, what it says is that you're not actively racist. You may even be think of yourself as anti-racist, but if you don't reflect upon the institutions and the practices and the policies that you have in your organization, then you may actually be contributing to a long-term pattern that does exclude people. And I think universities are an obvious example of this. 
One other form of evidence is just, you know, look around the room, you know, in your classroom, look around the department, look around the university, look around the administrative leadership. Trent clearly has not succeeded in even achieving um, a statistical representation of ethnic diversity in Canada. So, you know, there is a problem there. Um, and I think this is a good time for us to think about it. But also, I mean, the blunt truth is that Trent, if you only um, listen to um, the perspectives of racialized faculty, you're really talking about probably less than 10 people in the social sciences and humanities for a start. So we need people to be, you know, bought into this. Um, we need people to um, decide for themselves that they want to contribute to discussing this and to transforming the institution. And that really means our white colleagues, both in administration and amongst the faculty. So what are the key things um, that, you know, I see at Trent or I've experienced at Trent? I've been on many hiring committees, for example. Um, I've been on some policy committees. Um, hiring in terms of what the faculty composition looks like is a really central issue for all universities, but particularly for Trent. And that's one of the major ways, perhaps the major way in which we might change um, institutional racism at Trent. So there's a lack of diversity. Um, I also have to say that in the many hiring committees I've done, um, the training around our biases, how they may affect um, our choices of who to shortlist or who to select, is either non-existent um, or it's not effective. It's not proper training, it's just a briefing. Um, and it doesn't really work. So I think that's a real problem. I think also, you know, one of the things that frustrates me is that, you know, university leaderships across Canada are signed up to various equity charters or equity commitments, um, including from Universities Canada, which has an action plan, um, and also from the research funding councils called the Dimensions Charter, which Trent is a signatory to. Both of those plans ask for specific actions and a specific strategic vision of what would be improved at a university. And as far as I know, Trent has not done that as an administration. Um, and I wonder whether it's just, you know, a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding. Um, but I do worry that it's actually a lack of commitment. And that in fact, one of the dangers we have right now is that universities, including Trent, will represent diversity in its marketing materials, as Trent does, but when it comes to actually making change, there's no skill, knowledge, and perhaps not even a commitment to really doing that. Um, and that's a problem It was illustrated to me very keenly a couple of months ago, when during the lockdown, Communications put out a video, which was you know, a supportive video of a local Peterborough um, charity, and it was done from a really great place of solidarity and compassion, but it was called Faces of Trend. And nobody at any stage of producing that video thought about the fact that it showed a severe lack of ethnic diversity and representation. And yet, if you go to Trent's marketing materials, that isn't the case. So one wonders, you know, is there really a kind of deep-seated understanding of why we would want to have more diversity, or is it just simply a marketing tool? So I guess there are two areas that I think are important in terms of how we make change. Um, and those would be executive leadership, right? So this is the senior administration of the university. Um, you know, that's, they're ultimately responsible for setting tone, for setting vision and policy and ensuring that trainings are effective, ensuring that um, there's a direction that the university wants to go in. But also we have to take responsibility as faculty, you know, as the people who get to control hirings to a large degree, as the people that get to decide what kinds of subjects we teach, which also might be an issue about how we don't recruit diverse staff, and also how we treat our students. So both faculty and administration are really central and crucial to any transformation of institutional racism at Trent. So I wanted to stop there and then hand over to my colleagues and hopefully we'll have some back and forth. Byron, would you like to um, introduce yourself and follow up on moment? Sure. I'm Byron Stoyles. I am an associate professor and the chair of the Department of Philosophy. I'm formerly a member of the executive committee of our faculty association, uh, a former member of the equity subcommittee for the faculty association, and I'm currently a member of the committee 
which I'll speak about in a minute, that's supposed to be tasked with, or that is actually tasked with addressing EDI concerns on campus. Um, I won't repeat what Moment said. I, I agree with all of it. Um, I think there's lots of evidence of institutional racism. Um, we can provide that evidence if people need it. Um, but that's not what I want to make my focus. Um, I also want to um, just quickly repeat and then build off of the idea that Moment suggested that um, institutional racism doesn't mean that individuals are racist. And in fact, institutional racism is consistent with individuals being committed to doing better uh, and to treating all people with respect. Um, so where have we failed? Um, I think largely we failed because we've been focused on um, our duties rather than setting aspirational goals, developing policies that will help actually make concrete changes. Um, we focused on compliance. Um, we focused on trying to do what we ought to, uh, whereas what we ought to do, I think, is not try to stumble over a low bar set, um, but to set the bar much higher. Uh, and then jump over that. Um, so can I be more concrete? Um, absolutely, I can be more concrete. Um, dealing with uh, institutional racism can be uncomfortable. Um, the first step is admitting that we have a problem or that there are problems. We have to admit that some of us have had advantages as we enter the academic profession, uh, as we progress through the ranks, as we're um, having our work and our contributions assessed. Uh, and we have to acknowledge that um, we're not as an inclusive uh, community as we might hope. Uh, and that uh, moment has provided some of the evidence for. Um, so what do we do about this? Um, I don't wanna suggest that we're doing nothing. Um, I do wanna suggest though that we're very slow about this. And so one of the things that we have done, uh, faculty and administration, uh, has committed to the generation of a subcommittee uh, that will try to address questions uh, about EDI uh, and move the discussion forward in concrete ways. Uh, this was accomplished in the last round of collective bargaining. That committee has been formed, as far as I understand, uh, for both the employer or administration and the faculty association, and, and we hope to do some of that work uh, in concrete terms in the next weeks and months. So what are we looking at? We're looking at recruitment and hiring practices. Uh, and I think Moment is exactly right to point out that uh, this is a problem for executive level uh, and administrators, and this is a problem for faculty. Uh, we need uh, to train, we need to become educated about how our biases play into hiring decisions. Uh, we need to recognize that if we really are true to our word that we are uh, committed to equity, uh, diversifying faculty and, and generating a more inclusive um, faculty body and community at Trent uh, that we actually need to implement uh, good practices for doing so. Um, we talk often about the challenges. The challenges are related to, for instance, budget cuts and budget limitations and we only have so many positions and we need to fill the traditional uh, positions to fill the gaps so our traditional curricula are covered and so on. Um, and I think we need to get more creative than that. Um, whenever we have a crisis, we also have an opportunity to make some changes. And so I think we need to be more creative. So as the department chair of philosophy, a discipline which uh, admittedly is very male and very white, um, I could jokingly say, uh, what is the image of a philosopher? It's a bearded, bespectacled male. Uh, what do we need to do? We need to acknowledge that some of us are privileged in our disciplines and, and we need to um, actually show that we're committed to doing better moving forward. Um, and how do we do that? We can get more creative in the positions. We can uh, challenge our traditional canons in our disciplines. We can move past the things that philosophers and uh, people in other disciplines have traditionally thought were important. We can ask questions about why it is that there aren't more people that look different, that sound different, that think differently, that have different experiences, aren't entering our disciplines. So the so-called pipeline concerns. Uh, and, and then we can get more creative in our positions. So we can post positions uh, that would call for scholars specializing in areas of interest to people who have typically been marginalized or are part of uh, groups that have been marginalized. We can challenge the canons, we can develop new ideas and so on. So I think there's lots of room uh, for improvement and I hope that we can talk about some more of those uh, areas for improvement moving forward as we keep going. 
we'll pause there. Thanks, Byron. Moman, you wanted to jump in for a second? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I thought that was a really good summary of the ways that we can improve. And it really struck me, Byron, when you were talking about um, the pressures on hiring. You know, we're a small university. Um, hiring, you know, new positions are, um, you know, rare. Um, but we also have lots of contract staff. Um, and a lot of those tend to be, you know, from equity seeking groups because they're earlier in the profession. Um, but one of the things that I found frustrating as well and like, is that if, um, you know, if the university had really kind of gotten together a plan as an administration for how do we approach equity, and some of those claims for positions would have a different criteria attached to them, right? Like it would be like, okay, well, this is an important position, but it also actually um, helps us reach those targets. Um, and so I just wondered if you could, in that sort of joint committee, and I know you guys haven't met yet, but, um, you know, how do we approach that as a kind of, um, you know, people, put, departments putting in hires where equity is actually an important criteria of that? Like, is, how far away do you think we are from that kind of a, a position? Um, how, how far are we away? I'm not sure, because um, that committee hasn't started its work and I won't speak for other members of that committee. I think people are committed to doing better and we need to do more than talk about this. Um, so what do we need? Um, I can talk about concrete things to do. There's no individual person or office that's immediately accountable for EDI issues at Trent. Uh, mm. And by that, I mean, um, there is no individual that's immediately responsible and accountable for uh, developing policies. I'll talk more about that for setting targets, for setting goals, for actually identifying what our aspirations are uh, and doing that in a measurable way. There's no particular uh, individual or office at Trent, um, at least publicly, that is actually you know, measuring um, anything uh, related to EDI. So I think we have some data, we need better data, we need to report the data, we need to have measurable goals, we need to actually be trying to meet those goals and we need to report back to faculty. So uh, I'm hoping that, I'm hoping, I won't speak for the others on the committee, but I'm hoping that we can make some inroads uh, to identify those issues. Um, it seems like we're glacially slow uh, in making progress and I hope what we can do is move that process um, to a higher gear, to a higher speed moving forward so that we can actually identify uh, individuals or offices that are going to drive this process in a, in a proactive positive way uh, and, and what's going to happen uh, when that happens. But part of that is setting priorities. Part of that is, is setting um, and actually implementing uh, policies that will be helpful. So Trent, like most Canadian universities, has blanket statements when we do hirings, hirings that we're committed to all people and equity and so on. Mm -hmm. um, those statements are great, um, but they don't do much for us in concrete terms. So um, in recent hiring processes in the philosophy department, for instance, I can say that it's been very difficult to figure out how to, uh, in a way that's um, consistent, uh, with all of our existing policies and contracts and so on, um, to actually rank um, diversity um, or the way in which candidates would diversify our faculty um, in relation to other criteria that we're searching for. Um, I can say that there is some training for hiring committees. Um, I think it's probably a little bit inconsistent given um, my experiences and it, and it probably needs to be better. Uh, we need to do better as hiring committees to actually build these things in. So we have this idea of um, some faculty members being great fits for our programs. Our biases play in there. Um, we, we don't address uh, in many instances, in concrete terms, way to address biases in, in the consideration of the value of people's contributions. Uh, we talk about research output, for instance, but we don't tend to talk about what influences research output. We don't, or productivity, we don't tend to discuss uh, what can play into that, what kinds of things should be counted, and so on. So I think we can do better, and that starts with identifying uh, individuals or offices that will drive this process and that should lead them to very particular measurable goals uh, and policies to match. Super, thank, thank you, Brian, Byron. Um, and now I'm gonna ask Jillian to, build, to both introduce herself uh, mm -hmm. and um, to build on our conversation. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Jillian Belcourt. I'm a sociologist, uh, colleague of Moments. Um, I'm a criminologist by 
critical criminologist by training. And what that has led to is sort of a, an attempt to introduce and dare I radicalize um, curriculum in, within my department by proposing various courses and things like that. But also along that way, um, I have learned very quickly that what is required in order to um, transform curriculum um, is to be able to hire deeply and richly um, because as a white woman, um, it's very difficult for me to be comfortable in presenting content to students where there is no lived experience and there is no consciousness. Um, there can be solidarity. Um, but I've, I've come to understand that my way through this difficulty as someone who believes strongly in the role of a university in transforming and improving the human experience is that we need to do better in terms of um, changing the faces that students see and the voices that students hear. So I've chosen to move into senior leadership um, within the post-secondary environment. And what that has meant for me is to, at this particular moment, as, as um, Moment and Byron were explaining at this particular moment, is really a critical reckoning of how institutions um, generally uh, are beginning to take account of themselves, both in terms of the work they do and the work they don't do. So I've spent intellectually a lot of my career um, sort of documenting overrepresentation and systemic racism within the correctional environment. And, you know, that has relied heavily on data, good data. And that is a very important part of this conversation as well. How do we know what we don't know? Um, there is a way that we need to start taking account uh, for our, not only our hiring um, practices and therefore to set attainable goals, as Byron was saying, but we also need to understand the experiences of students and faculty as they encounter these um, biased and sort of uh, hostile environments um, in, in some of their dealings with, with the university administrators as, as well as colleagues. Um, I really like the idea that Byron was talking about the fact that there is a need for leadership um, on the level of creating an accountability structure, right? So who is responsible for capturing the data, for driving policy review and, and change? So I'm thinking for myself, as I leave you know, a faculty uh, position of being chair for um, a number of years and, and driving curriculum change, now moving into a more senior leadership role, I've learned a lot about the importance of how valuable external searches are in rich, enriching um, our faculty and administrative complement. Those external searches, in my view, should be required for anything at the decimal level and higher. Um, there, it, it, it is just a way of disrupting uh, representation and narrative in a very critical way. I'm also struck by how universities across the country, especially as we see it in the COVID moment, are struggling with the loss of international students. And I think what that signals is this very paradoxical relationship between the need to inter internationalize for budgetary reasons, yet a relative inattention to the need to pay attention to our own lack of diversity and representation of, of visible minorities. So it, it's, it's an uncomfortable feeling or, or sort of uncomfortableness about under recognizing this tension that we have in, in relation to uh, international students, uh, versus um, international faculty. So I think when I've gone through leadership training, and you know, for talking about next steps, right? When I've gone through leadership training in in my own professional development, there's been a real silence around um, how best to address and capture um, the need for this kind of progressive leadership. So the implicit bias concerns in hiring committees, how do we train up and away from those kinds of practices? Um, you know, how do we engage in establishing hiring um, statements and, and practices that 
make it possible for Byron as chair of a, a, of a philosophy department to be successful in, in, uh, in creating a diverse uh, faculty complement. I think the other thing we need to maybe think about is um, students need to see themselves in, 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 you know, in classrooms and they need to feel that they are respected and heard and somehow that means that we need to stand back as you know white privileged academics and advocate for and support the hiring of typically you know junior academics who come into the job search market as ABBs and, and and supporting them and advocating for them i think universities will only benefit from this kind of recognition of diversity students will res will resonate with students if they see themselves being represented so universities have an opportunity in a selfish way again to you know become successful um, in embracing um, equity and diversity so there's there's possibilities in this so the, on, on one hand there is a, a moment of reckoning there is a there is a crisis of institutional racism that's been exposed to us yet again how are universities responding to it? You know, I think this is a this is an opportunity, as, as um, Byron was saying, as much as it is a crisis. Thank you, thank you, Jillian. Um, I, did anybody want to have any comments to respond to Jillian, um, or I? Moment, yeah. I'd like to. Um, can you guys hear me? I wonder if my internet has gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your face is frozen, but your voice is, yeah. voice is strong. <laughs> Sounds like a country and western song. Yeah. <laughs> well, now we've, I, now. Did I freeze? I yeah. felt like I froze. Yeah. Um, yeah, it struck me, I, like I thought that, um, you know, that, that's kind of clear that the leadership um, needs to be more um, bought into this, but there's this real tension between those kind of policy statements, you know, and the kind of, I think there is slightly a recognition about marketing, right? Like they want to, they want, they make sure at trend that there's always racialized students in the pictures, but, um, and I hadn't thought about the, um, the, the lack of external searches before, but you're right that that, you know, if you only choose from within the pool and the pool's already, you know, 98% white, it's going to stay like that. Um, but it also relates back to Byron's point about, you know, who do we, you know, do, um, who do we get to take responsibility for this? And the, one of the things that I found frustrating working through the union here, um, but also working with my colleagues as chairs and faculty board, where all the administrators and all the chairs are, is that um, I raise this issue um, but I'm, you know, there's me and there's an indigenous colleague and usually that's it. Mm -hmm. um, and at Trent, the reaction I get from administrators and from colleagues who are white really seems to be this kind of minoritizing reaction. This is kind of an issue just for you or you're concerned about this because you're a minority. But this is actually an issue for the university. This is an issue for all of us in our profession. Um, and I can't seem to break out of that um, you know, that box or that kind of stereotype um, in their view. And I, like, well, how much do we need to change to get to the point where people, you know, I could raise that issue and people say, yeah, this is an issue for everybody. It isn't just an issue. It, it isn't just somebody who looks like mom in raising this. Right. Like how, what, you know, what level of transformation do you see needed in leadership? No, I think it, I think that's a really valid point that generally what happens is that, um, we expect the people who are the most oppressed and the most marginalized to raise our consciousness, right? By sort of right. pointing these things out to us. So there is, there is a, an accountability factor um, that, you know, Byron's alluding to the creation of a centralized sort of apparatus or part of the architecture of a university that would be held accountable and would be driving policy reviews and changes. You know, I, I think that's one solution and a needed one, but I think there, there is this, and I just keep coming back to this notion of paradox, is that everywhere else, globalization is a best practice, right? 
Right. And yet when it comes to understanding our own, you know, immediate context and how it is that we establish best practice, the notion of globalization is never, it's not a box that we have to tick. So, you know, and I think the interpretation of globalization too is, is an interesting one, right? In terms of how, how that gets taken up. But you're right. I think that the, the bad habits are moment tell me how not to be so white, right? Like that's kind of where we end up. But it, that's not where we end up. We end up with like, okay, we'll listen to you about this. Um, but then nothing happens. Yeah, no, I didn't say anything happens. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like <laughs> nothing happens. And it, it feels like, you know, there's a genuine, um, I think there's a genuine willingness. You know, I take my colleagues, you know, at, at, at their word. And I think there's a willingness to listen. Um, yeah. But there isn't a willingness to see that critique as something that is anything other than, you know, personal experience. And that's, that's sort of frustrating. I just wanted to say something about the globalization aspect. It's if, if we take it, I know that you're not talking about just people from overseas. Um, you're talking about sort of, you know, the, the diversity that's developed in Canada, but there's, mm -hmm. there's evidence from Statistics Canada that within a generation, like more than 50% of high school children are gonna be racialized or mixed race in the GTA. And that's really our main you know, yes. um, drawing pool, right? Like for Durham, mm -hmm. but also for Peterborough. And it, I do wonder, it so sort of reminded me of that point you made about students need to see themselves. and. I kind of think that Trent is on a path to irrelevance if we don't transform, because we don't have many hires. Um, we have resistance to challenging the canon. Uh, we have some departments where, you know, say in the natural sciences, you're not talking about, um, you know, social issues, right? So they may see that as not being important, but in fact, they may have a better pipeline than us. Um, and I really kind of do think that um, Trent is, is kind of becoming this um, somewhat irrelevant place if it can't address those kinds of issues. And I know from personal experience, I did a, a, a lecture for a colleague in Amsterdam right at the beginning of the pandemic, and it was half racialized students. Um, we were talking about issues around racialization and sexuality. Um, I made two of them cry. Um, they emailed me afterwards and it was, they, but they were saying like, you know, I, I've just never been taught by somebody who looks like me and who understands the culture. And, you know, it, it really was an eye opening learning experience for them. Now, that's not going to happen every time, but we can't, you know, that I think that that strikes me when that happens to me as a teacher. And then I think, oh, what are these students feeling in other courses? Right? Like how, how excluded do they feel or not? Belonging do they feel? And that's a bit of a threat to us as an institution, economically, right, as well as reputation. Can I, 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 absolutely, and maybe it's a chance for me to jump on, jump in and ask you, I think what follows from that in a sense is one of the things that we wanted to think about today, which is what actually would a real educational sort of diversity and inclusion process or a real, what would be a real outcome? What would it look like? And I'm, I'm kind of with you there in the sense of going to meetings and, and you know, we talk about diversity and you know, check there's, you know, check with gender, check with indigenous, check with a racialized person, and that that equals diversity. But um, from what we're saying, I mean, diversity against measured against what? And at what level is it just that I look around and see a couple of people that look like me and I say, well, there we go. We've checked the diversity box. What would it, it's clear there's diff, different components. So what do you see it looking like? Uh, what, what, what should it look like? Where, where are we trying to get to? Byron, you talked about stumbling over the low bars and missing the higher bars. What, um, where do we want to be then? Um, I'll maybe jump in to start the, as a philosopher, I hope you'll um, excuse me for getting a bit abstract. The, I think we talk a lot. Um, I think the recent protests and the recent political environment um, in our neighbors to the south and, and globally and in our own country um, are really drawing attention to uh, systemic racism and institutional racism. Um, I remember after the financial collapse where we had the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, I think it's great that we're drawing attention to these issues and remembering Occupy Wall Street. I think it's important for the rubber to actually hit the road um, and for us to actually make some changes. And so 
Um, Julian and Moman have already um, alluded to this. Um, we haven't always listened to the voices that aren't traditionally heard or noticed. Uh, we're doing maybe a little bit better job than that. Often we nod, we agree, and we move on. We don't do much, much about it. We need to move, um, as Jillian was uh, suggesting, to do some more of this work ourselves. We shouldn't rely on people who identify as members of marginalized groups to do the work for us, to educate us. Um, we have lots of good evidence. Uh, we need to develop good moral perception. Uh, a term um, that one of my colleagues, Catherine Norlock, uses. Uh, we have evidence that there's a problem. We have lots of it. It's staring us in the face every time we turn on the news, every time we uh, look on the internet these days, every time we recognize a new uh, protest and so on. Uh, we have lots of evidence when we look around our classrooms and in our meetings, departmental or administrative. Um, and so we need to use our good moral perception, and that means um, identifying that this is a salient concern. So we need to check our assumptions. We need to actually um, implement policies that will make a change. So what would this look like? Uh, we would have a more diverse faculty body. We would have faculty in front of students that students of all backgrounds, of all appearances, of all identities um, can relate to. Uh, we have a faculty that is actually listening um, and conveying the messages that they're, that they're hearing. We have um, systems in place where colleagues have an equal chance to getting into the profession with good jobs. Um, Moman was suggesting, uh, I think correctly, that a lot of our jobs right now are not tied to very secure positions. Uh, they don't have the, the kind of pay uh, that the rest of us have or the chance of uh, career progression that the rest of us have. We need to address that. That might require throwing some resources uh, into the mix. Um, we need to do better at these things. Um, we need to have an environment where people who identify as um, members of marginalized groups or who don't look like uh, what many of us look like in the institutions actually feel comfortable. Uh, we need them to want to come to Trent, um, faculty and students. We need them to want to continue to be at Trent uh, and feel like they're valued members of the committee. So um, that's fairly abstract um, in terms of how we go, but what will it look like? It will actually look more, we, we will look more diverse. Um, we will actually look and feel more inclusive um, and it goes beyond marketing. Um, I think, well, just if I could jump in there, I, I yeah. think to add to that, um, from a leadership perspective, I think there needs to be, yes, at the departmental level in terms of hiring and recruitment and, and everything else. But I think, I mean, our, our leadership structures are dated, right? Like they reproduce a particular kind of, of governance structure. So, you know, you make reference to some really innovative positions um, like a, a provost of equity and diversity issues, right? Like that is that is innovative so you know heather your question about what does it look like i think we need to create governance structures that value diversity and equity themselves right as opposed to these assumptions that you know we will be compliant with you know federal and, and provincial laws and regulations with regards to you know we will not discriminate no it's, it's got to go deeper than that Right? It needs to be cooked into the actual structure of how decisions are made. Okay, so I'll, yeah, I guess I'll just add my two cents worth there. Um, so I think those are both really interesting points. And Julian is um, raising the, uh, the innovations that are happening in some of the larger universities where they're creating vice provosts of equity, diversity, inclusion, you know, they have a, a serious kind of administrative heft. Um, one of the problems i think with um trent is that, that the response has always been well we're small we can't hire we don't have that many resources so that kind of mindset needs to you know to be overcome because it seems like it's just another excuse um because when we do want to hire a more diverse faculty or when there's resources in it we actually do do it and i'm thinking here about um uh, the the kind of response to the TR the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the fact that Trent has a long established um, Indigenous Studies program, um, but that wasn't when I first got here that wasn't actually particularly well supported um, and was a little bit insecure and I think the consequences of the TRC have have um, and to be blunt as well I think some of the funding that's been attached to that has made that more secure um, and 
so when it seems a little, this is a cynical take on it, but I think university administrations, when they see some funding attached to something, then they'll go for it. Um, I don't know how much of a commitment that really is um, in a deep way, but that doesn't really matter. They're creating, you know, they, if they can create a cluster of, of um, you know, people who are focusing on a particular issue, um, then, you know, as academics, we can kind of do what we want to do. And I think that's why we have such a strong, um, you know, faculty complement, although, again, you know, they, they're facing retirements, but a strong kind of, um, uh, you know, academic vision and uh, program in Indigenous studies. And on a much, so in a much shorter scale than what Byron was talking about, um, you know, what would it look like at Trent? I think in the immediate future, we have to really think about, are we going to do some cluster hires? Mm -hmm. Like, are we going to, um, you know, actually just make a commitment to transforming, you know, various different programs in social sciences and humanities um, around racialization, like courses that can be taught across different programs and hire a bunch of people that do that. They may actually be located in different departments. You know, we have, um, it's pretty public knowledge that Trent just failed to meet its um, targets for visible minorities in the CRC program. I mean, why that happened is, is you know, unfathomable, right? Like, why would we not hit our targets for such prestigious, um, you know, uh, funding program? Um, but um, if those opportunities are there in the near future, maybe we use those to anchor the hiring of a cluster of people who are racialized. And that brings a transformation um, to hopefully more than one program. Um, it brings a, a group of faculty together who can then contribute to this educational process and perhaps in five or 10 years, more of a leadership process within Trent um, without it all relying upon you know, somebody like me or, you know, some of my other colleagues who are here at Trent. Um, so I wonder if in immediate practical terms for a small university, it has to be this very active decision mm -hmm. to create, um, you know, a cluster hire. Also, I, I, you know, we do have some departments outside of the social sciences um, who actually are pretty well represented in terms of um, ethnic diversity. And I think learning from them, um, that may be a pipeline consequence. They may just say, well, this is the pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still, even if that, that's what they say, there's, it still means that they're not operating certain biases in who they shortlist to be interviewed. So I think that that's a, uh, an immediate thing um, that we can do. We can learn from the bits of Trent that have actually been quite successful, including indigenous studies, including these other departments. So that's, that's what it would look like. I want to um, just finish on, you know, sometimes I've had colleagues, this is not just at Trent, but it happens at Trent. You know, academics always say, well, we have academic freedom, we, we, we're not biased, and this is just the result of, you know, the higher, what the place looks like is just Very the result hard. of, <laughs> of um, yeah, like it's just, it's, this is just what it is. It's, this is academic freedom. And I'm like, okay, but like, if that were true, then in fact, it could be flipped, right? And even though ethnic minorities are a minority in Canada, you could actually have a department that's all racialized philosophers. Because if it was just on merit, why wouldn't we end up, why wouldn't it look like that, right? Why would, Why does it look white? Mm -hmm. So it's, yeah, you know, yeah. maybe what it looks like for me ultimately is a department of, you know, um, once Byron is retired, because I don't want him to lose his job, um, just, you know, <laughs> all black philosophers teaching Hegel. Why not? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't jump in on Hegel. Um, I, I agree with what's been said. I, I think part of the move, as Jillian says, is, is changing the structure and, and getting more creative and, and um, I would use the word radical there. Um, the radical is probably not the right word. G getting more um, progressive, um, getting more correct, mm -hmm. and not in a political way. Actually getting this right. We've got the evidence. We know in many cases what to do. I think part of it then is, is changing the structure, but part of it is changing the stance. Um, we've, been, we've been awfully reactive. Um, so we do have groups uh, on campus that are dealing with harassment, discrimination, equity concerns, and so on. But they, but they tend to be complaints driven, uh, mm -hmm. and that puts the that puts the burden back on the people who actually need the support rather than, um, you know, the people that may be the problem, uh, in a case of a complaint. And so, um, what we need is activity. Um, this takes work. Um, if we don't do anything, we'll just maintain the status quo. And so I think that's consistent with what all of us have been saying in different ways. Uh, this won't be easy. Uh, it might not be cheap. Um, I don't know whether uh, financially or otherwise, um, but it's worth it. If we're actually committed to this, 
then we need to prove that. And uh, I think we say that diversity and inclusion uh, and equity are priorities at Trent. We say that a lot. I think we probably even mean it a lot. And yet every time we hit a crisis, those discussions fall, fall by the wayside immediately. Oh, we have a shortage of money. We're worried about funding. We need this, we need that. And those discussions um, typically come off the, the table or, or fall to the wayside. If we're really committed, then we need to put those, we need to actively put those concerns front and center whenever we have a crisis or um, regardless of whether we're perceiving that there are other crises we're trying to deal with. I would say as well that part of the challenge, and this is more the the cultural aspect, the subcultural aspect of, of academe is that faculty who choose to step away from research intensive aspects of their career to focus on the service side, right? To sort of do the work, the heavy lifting around institutional change and policy development. There is a, there is a stigma that comes with that. I think um, we don't support our colleagues well who choose to be service focused um, as well as, you know, good researchers and things like that. I think there's almost sort of a certain social capital that comes with being indifferent to service and being against service, right? Like you're not really an academic if you're invested in the institution. So I, you know, that's maybe more of a personal reflection, but I, I think that's something that we need to own in terms of how do we support each other in doing this work. So MOMEN is the face of these conversations. How do we support him in doing that work? We have our own work to do, absolutely. I'm not saying MOMEN, fight the good fight for us and let us know how it turns out. But I think that there is a wall that we face that we need to own as institutional members where we don't support our colleagues who choose a route of, of you know, grinding administrivia. Um, and, you know, there, there is some sort of judgment that is being passed on our academic rigor, right? Our, our right to, be, to say that we're a scholar. So I think there's lots of struggles, yeah. right? There's different ones. I'm not saying this is a, a really important one. It's just one that I think we need to recognize is, you know, why don't, like Byron, I mean, you should be going up for full professor, right? And you're, but you're so busy doing all these really great things with the unions and, you know, working the triple day. Um, and it's like, why are those blocks there, right? Why, why, where does service sit in relation to, um, merit and things like that. Those are but other institutional changes, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, one of the paradoxes again, or the the um, issues around that, is that um, you know, I don't I don't think I would have had as much ability to engage in these debates yeah. Yeah. Um, and as much authority yeah. unless I was also regarded as a good yeah. scholar. Like yeah. it's you know, and I've I've absolutely done much more of this. Um, since I got promoted, um, because, you know, partly there's also nowhere else to get promoted to, like, you know, we don't have um, another rank. Um, but, you know, I think I did, it does give me some protection um, because I feel vulnerable talking about these things because you're calling out, or people perceive that you're calling out them as colleagues or you're calling out the institution and being involved in the union or being a full professor who has you know, a good scholarship record protects me a little bit from yeah. from that kind of, oh, you're just, um, you know, you're just whining because you're not good enough to be, um, mm -hmm. to belong. And, you know, that's, that's the same mindset that's used about why we don't shortlist certain people, right? Because the criteria is, that, well, they're not really good enough. They didn't get their um, degree sure. from uh, U of T. They got it from, you know, somewhere where it was easier to get in. And it's like, well, yeah, but they came from a community where, very few people go on to higher education and this was the route that they took, right? Like this was this was what was possible for them, but we don't think about that. So it, I understand what you're saying and I think that's right that we have to revalue those things. But at the moment you might have a generation who feel that they can't, they can't, um, you know, they can't, they can't throw, um, help throw a ladder down behind them until they're regarded as legitimate, right? So that's another kind of tension, I think, as well there. 
Well, as a moderator rather than panelists, but I'm uh, maybe just to, to wrap up and bring together those last ideas uh, for someone like me who's not been particularly involved. I mean, this is one, one reason why I was really excited that we were doing this Zoom because I, as a, as a administrator, a fairly new administrator, I have not really been involved in these kinds of discussions. And I'm, I don't think, that's, I'm not unusual in terms of our, 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 our faculty members. I, this is something that is, I think, extremely important. Um, it's easy to post stuff on Facebook about how racist the rest of the world is. And, and that's easy, but I think it's really, really, really important. I mean, each and every one of us, I, I mean, I don't know, it sounds, this sounds, I don't want to sound like Pollyanna, but each and every one of us has, has this opportunity here. And I think we need to get informed. And I think this kind of discussion that the three of you have brought to us and your colleagues at Trent and other people that will watch this this um, discussion is is absolutely crucial and I think truthfully um, if you had to talk about next steps this is I think what you're doing now is the next step because this is a this is something that each of us has to has to talk to and own and uh, um, and understand that it's not just moments problem to bring this up in, in a faculty meeting and, and that, that moment isn't responsible for changing the world of diversity at Trent that, that we all are. So, so I want to thank you all, um, Moment and Jillian and, and Byron. And uh, Jillian, I I'm just, sorry you're leaving. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry you're leaving too. I just, <laughs> I just want to say time. before we <laughs> stop the recording that um, there, are, there are actually lots of other people at Trent who do raise mm -hmm. this from marginalized groups. It isn't just me, yeah. I think. Um, so I don't want people watching this to go other um, racialized minorities or you know indigenous colleagues don't raise these issues they oh, absolutely no, no, no. No, I think I, it's just that I've become a bit more um, you know engaged with talking to the admin talking to um, tough and you know feel secure mm -hmm. enough to do this kind of thing so mm -hmm. um, so I just want to you know make that acknowledgement isn't and, and I'm talking about people like me um, you know not and I'm very people. sad Julia's leaving because mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. we're not going to get her post replaced yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. We should stop there, and we'll have another conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Going to need to edit that out with more.